Hello. On behalf of the Institute of International Shipping and Trade Law, I would like to welcome you to another lunchtime webinar. In fact, this is the fourth one of the year for us, and this one certainly promises to be an interesting one. Uh, today, with an expert panel, we shall discuss the legal position with regard to smart contracts and elaborate to what extent they can change shipping and commercial practices. Um, this is an area that the Law Commission is actively working on, and we are delighted that two members of that team, namely Laura Borgoin, uh, who is the head of the Commercial and Common Law team, and Daniela Lupini, uh, the lead lawyer on small contracts, will be with us. Uh, Professor Green had to respond to an urgent uh, engagement, so she will not make it. But I'm sure Laura and Daniela will make an excellent contribution, given that they are the ones leading the Law Commission's work in this field together with uh, Professor Green. We are also lucky to have Julian Clark, uh, Global Senior Partner of INS, and Grant Hunter, Head of Com Contracts and Closes at PIMCO. Uh, both Julian and Grant are good friends of the Institute, uh, but they are also brilliant lawyers with huge amount of practical experience in the field behind them. We are hoping to hear from them, particularly the industry's view on the potential use of smart contracts. Last but not least on the panel, I'm delighted that my colleague, uh, Professor Tettenborn, will be with us to share his views. Andrew needs very, uh, needs very little introduction, but I don't think I'm going to be accused of being biased if I say he is one of the most knowledgeable common law academics in the world. Okay, after that introduction, back to business. Um, we have chosen a discussion format for this event. That means that I shall direct the questions to the panel and we develop the discussion based on their answers. Uh, at the end, uh, we are very happy uh, to pass your questions to the panel members. So please feel free to post your questions uh, to the Q&A section of the Zoom facility. Um, we shall try to answer them as long as time allows, and it's our intention to finish uh, within an hour. Um, without further ado, I think it's time to start uh, with the questions. And I would like to first introduce uh, a question, uh, introduce the topic with a question to Professor Tettenborn. Uh, Andrew, could you please tell us what smart contracts are? and uh, what legal problems you personally foresee if the use of smart contracts were to become common in shipping and trade practice? Right. Um, a smart contract, if you wanted a definition of a smart contract, uh, it's a contract which is not so much um, entered into or expressed in machine readable format but one that's actually performed automatically. Um, now, on one score, actually, you could say that smart contracts have been with us for something like 100 years. Um, in the days when you were allowed to sell cigarettes from vending machines, uh, if, you put, if you put a coin in a vending machine and the vending machine automatically supplied you with a pack of cigarettes, um, Quite arguably, actually, you could say that that was the original form of a smart contract, and there undoubtedly would be contractual terms about the merchantability of the cigarettes and so on. Uh, but obviously, what we're talking about these days is um, contracts that are embodied in machine readable form, in computer readable form, and in addition, are actually performed as a result of computer algorithms rather than human decisions. Because uh, after all, any contract can be expressed in machine readable form. You know, there's no law saying a contract has to be written on paper. Um, but rather more importantly here, this kind of contract is not only written in machine readable form, but performed automatically as well. I'll give you a couple of examples. 
Uh, one will be very familiar to Barish, actually, as our insur the guy who's forgotten more about insurance than the rest of us ever knew. Um, parametric insurance contracts. Um, so, for example, if you're about to fly off on holiday and you want to insure against your flight being cancelled because a new variety of COVID has arisen or something like that, uh, you can take out with Swiss Re a contract on your mobile phone. Um, you pay Swiss Re automatically. If your flight is cancelled, Swiss, Swiss Re will then automatically credit your account with 100 or 200 pounds or whatever degree of cover you've bought. And that's a, a classic example, actually, of a smart contract which you can buy as a consumer. Uh, now, obviously, this is much more about shipping. Um, in shipping itself, these contracts are very much in their infancy, but in trade, they're growing. Um, for example, if you have shipping documents related to a cargo uh, being entirely digitized, it's perfectly possible to have an arrangement under which um, a virtual shipping document like a bill of lading and other documents are sent by a seller to the buyer's bank. The buyer's bank's computer then checks those documents, and if they're in order, payment is automatically made electronically to the seller. Now, this isn't science fiction. It's been done, albeit experimentally. Um, there's a fairly famous example a couple of years ago um, when Bolero, that's the organization concerned with electronic bills of lading, teamed up with a thing called the Letter of Credit Network, and actually a cargo of wool from Australia was successfully shipped to China and paid for by the Chinese buyer in Nanjing. Uh, the cargo was successfully paid for um, by um, an automatic computer transfer on receipt of the documents. So essentially, that's what um, smart contracts are about. Um, you ask something about the legal difficulties or the problems that may arise. Um, there are one or two, actually. Uh, one of them is this, that the, the typical smart contract is indeed uh, something like that sale of wool by Australian sellers to Chinese buyers. Now, there's never been a difficulty about electronic presentation of shipping documents. That's well established in letter of credit law. Uh, there's even a thing excitingly called the electronic UCP, the EUCP 2.0 any of you are seriously suffering from insomnia, may I recommend it? Uh, but anyway, it, it's perfectly possible to present documents under a letter of credit electronically, but at present, most of the time, they have to be manually checked by a guy in the back office to make sure that they comply. Um, and the reason is that uh, there are detailed rules about what kind of bill of lading will suffice to operate a letter of credit, um, what the commercial invoice must say, and so on. Now, you can't digitize that, not until we have a great deal more AI than we have at the moment. So you will have to have a system of extensive digitization of documents. Now, this is something Grant can tell you all about because BIMCO has been in the document digita digitization business for years. Um, but basically, you've got to have a form of bill of lading, which is entirely digitized, where the entries made on the bill of lading are absolutely standardized 
so that a computer at the far end can simply check it off because computers are the ultimate tick box machines, much worse than any government. Um, but the computer at the other end can simply tick off the various things written on the bill of lading and say, yes, 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 yes. Uh, this bill of lading satisfies the arrangements we've made. And therefore, we as I as a computer will immediately set in motion um, the electronic payment. But anyway, that's one difficulty that will have to be solved before we can have um, extensive use of smart contracts in trade. Um, there are another number of technical ones. Um, deductions from payment actually is one rather difficult matter because you might say, for example, if you're a hard boiled shipping lawyer, uh, what about smart contracts in time charters? For after all, you know, the ship has been made available, the obligation of the charterer is simply to pay the hire at the beginning of every month. Uh, now that sounds brilliant, except for one thing, off hire clauses. Again, another recommendation for those of you who suffer from insomnia, uh, but off hire clauses allow deductions from hire in fairly complex circumstances. And obviously, uh, some means has to be found um, to allow digitization of the situations that are going to allow deduction from payments. Um, another one which might be a bit esoteric, but that's insolvency law. Um, because when a company goes insolvent, its accounts have to be frozen and nobody can sort of start paying money out of its account. Now that's fine if you've got a human being in charge of the decision to pay. The trouble is if you've got an algorithm, uh, that makes life slightly difficult and you may have to do something about insolvency law to deal with matters like preferences or un unlawful disbursements of the insolvent's assets after the technical beginning of an insolvency. And let me remind you that the time when an insolvency begins is actually remarkably complex. Don't start me on insolvency law. You know, you need to be a special kind of geek to understand it. Anyway, uh, but there are problems of insolvency. Um, there's also actually another practical problem. Uh, automatic contracts, smart contracts may give rise to cash flow difficulties. Let me explain why. I agree to sell you goods and I send you bum goods. And it's fairly clear the goods are bum. Now, if you're a human being, what you will do, or if you're a human being working for a company, what you'll do is you'll take a look at the goods and say, wait a moment, they've sent crap goods. Okay, we want them, but we're going to make a deduction. We're going to make a deduction on the basis of a set off of what we estimate the other guy owes us. Now that's actually very good for the buyer's cash flow, uh, because it means he doesn't have to pay up front and then recover from the seller. The difficulty with smart contracts paying for goods is of course that a computer can arrange payment. What it can't do is inspect the goods and estimate to what extent the goods are bad and therefore to what extent there might be a deduction. So um, buyers using smart contracts might need to be told, well, uh, there could be risks involved because essentially 
um, you might find it very difficult to exercise rights of set off. Again, I'll go, I can go further into that if anyone's absolutely fascinated, which I rather doubt. But th those I think of are, are, are the difficulties that I see. Um, I see Daniela's looking rather puzzled already, but never mind. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you. I think that was a very, very nice introduction and actually let lends itself to further questioning of the other members of the panel. So, uh, Julian, I mean, if, if I may, um, I would like to actually, based on what Andrew described, uh, direct this next question to you. Uh, what uses for smart contracts you expect to see in shipping and trade practice in particular? I know Andrew gave a much more general overview, but uh, focusing on shipping and trade, what uses you see? Irish, thank you. Uh, and I think Andrew did indeed set the foundation very, very well because he spoke about some of the utilizations. Um, I, I, do, I, there'll be people on this call and there's certainly people on the panel that have been in this game for a long time. And we've often seen in shipping on the horizon something that's going to absolutely change and, and revolutionize what we do. And we saw that with Y2K, and I remember being as a, as a junior associate at Clever Chance, writing advices and, and what was going to happen about Y2K, because it never happened. And, and then when, when the ISM code came in, we all thought there'd be rafts and rafts of litigation about the ISM code, and then that never happened. And then uh, Valero, of course, has been around for a while. But, but I really do think that smart contracts are going to make a significant impact in trade. I think it's going to be driven by two things mainly, the, the increase in digitalization across uh, the sector uh, and also what we're seeing from various studies of the level of cost saving in an industry which is now so cost sensitive. I was reading yesterday that as a result of COVID, the uh, cost of moving a 40 foot box from Asia to North Europe has increased by uh, from $2,000 to $9,000. Um, so where there are savings to be made uh, by utilization of smart contracts, I think that will drive the technology and the adoption of it. So in answer to your question, Barish, where do I, where do I see this coming in? Um, letters of credit, uh, as Andrew has already spoken about, um, increasingly, I think will be digitalized. Uh, bills of lading, I think, I think the, the technology and the utilization of blockchain resolves what for years has been an issue with the, the adoption of electronic bills. Um, and we've struggled as an industry with electronic bills since 1855. Uh, I think now that what we'll see by the utilization of blockchain and bills of, and electronic bills is a true electronic bill uh, usage. Interesting that Andrew brought up uh, charter parties. I had a little note for myself saying, well, why not digitalize a time charter? Uh, and Andrew, of course, is completely correct when he when he talks about the issues with smart contracts and deductions. And what do you do about uh, off hire? But here's one to throw back to Andrew. What if I use uh, Internet of Things technology so that I have sensors that, for example, identify if there's been an engine breakdown and I tie that into my smart contract? So what I do is I, I really start to look at my off hire clauses to look at events, and, and let's do this in voyage charter context as well to make it really exciting and sexy. Uh, let's look at things like rain days or when hatches are opened or closed. And I use uh, security cameras and internet of things sensors to say when it's raining. So we automate all that. Now, I agree, nowhere near the degree of certainty, if that's right, because if it was right as lawyers, we wouldn't have a job to do, of, of a human interface. But if there's a saving in cost because we've digitalized off hire, we've digitalized demurrage, will people care? So I think we will potentially see, uh, perhaps the technology isn't quite there to do this, but a complete digitalization of, of uh, charter contracts. And then again, Andrew was quite right again when he said where well, you've really seen this take, take off more than pure shipping is in the field of trade. And in the field of trade, you see the utilization straight away. So inventory and distribution management, <clears throat> real-time cargo tracking, um, more uh, efficient management of logistics operations, uh, 
And then if you look at the, uh, uh, the system that Bunker Trace have introduced, um, tracking of bunkers, both for uh, verification of uh, origin and supply chain, so dealing with sanctions issues, uh, and then very cleverly, which still amazes and fascinates me, the fact that you can now uh, digitally tag uh, a bunker fuel so you, you can actually trace not only its uh, legal title in origin, but also look into whether or not there's been any admixing, any contamination uh, by DNA tagging. Um, and if you take that example that Bunker Trace have, have already you know, got, got effectively on the market uh, for bunkers, uh, look at all the issues that we've had in the industry in relation to the transportation and casualties as the result of carriage of dangerous goods. And will we see dangerous goods uh, being uh, carried in accordance with smart contracts so as to, again, deploy Internet of Things technology uh, to look at temperature changes in dangerous goods, qualities of dangerous goods, uh, identification and verification of uh, dangerous goods. So I think there is a huge area uh, of opportunity for the uh, adoption of smart contracts within the shipping industry. Thank you very much, Julian. I think that's, again, a very, very interesting uh, discussion there because uh, you, you brought up some of the issues maybe it didn't cross my mind in the first side. So uh, we might come back to that if you allow me. Uh, I would like to turn to actually to Grant because uh, both Andrew and uh, Julian mentioned uh, things which will happen or are likely to happen. But Grant has some experience with the use of smart contracts, not personally, but in his capacity uh, at BIMCO. Uh, I believe, uh, Grant, BIMCO had some experience with the development of smart contracts uh, in certain aspects of shipping. Could you please share your experience with us? What was your experience? What was the issues? How did it uh, work? Yeah, certainly. I mean, from BIMCO's perspective, we try to be proactive, to look to the future, to see the way the industry may go with the new developments in, in technology. And a few years ago, we also came upon this concept of smart contracts. And I think it's important to, to, to distinguish, I've I listened to the, the previous two speakers here, I think we were talking on one hand, digitalization in terms of removing the paper process and speeding up processes in general. And then smart, con, smart contracts, which to me uh, is, is the focus on this sort of self-executing aspect of the contract. It's not just digitalization in general. I think, yes, there are massive cost savings to be had from digitalization. When it comes to smart contracts themselves, contracts or parts of contracts which will self-execute, um, I think we're looking at something quite different, quite challenging for the industry. Um, what we did a few years back was to look to see what would be the best type of contract to carry out some sort of uh, pilot study proof of concept. Uh, we thought about voyage charter parties and time charter parties, and for all the reasons that Julian and Andrew have mentioned, uh, we, they, they ticked all the two difficult boxes, really. We thought there were many, many challenges there that would be easy to overcome uh, looking at a pilot study. So what we focused on was a bunker purchase contract. If you could purchase bunkers uh, and to actually make the payment process self-executing. So say, for instance, you take a delivery of bunkers, if there's no uh, claims or issues relating to the quantity that's loaded, if there are no subsequent claims on quality, then maybe at the end of your 30-day credit period, the contract would self-execute a payment to the bunker supplier. That's what we focused on and we developed that. And in terms of proof of concept, yes, it would work. Um, then we went out to people in, in the, uh, the commercial world and said, look, we're looking at this. Um, what interest would you have in a self-executing bunker purchase contract? Because we can make this happen. The technology is there. We've got blockchain. We've got self-executing contracts. It can all happen. You can have a tremendous audit trail. Uh, it, it could be a reality. Um, it was a bit of a lukewarm reaction, to be quite honest. And people were questioning, you know, just because you can do something with technology doesn't mean you should do something. And people often feel very uncomfortable about the concept of an automated payment scheme. Um, because there are, you know, in, in certain cases, there's a certain amount of sort of commercial leverage you, you can have in delaying payments. Um, automated payments are obviously far swifter. Um, it's this perhaps feeling of, of lack of control that they weren't very comfortable with. And we also, you know, we work in a very conservative uh, shipping industry. People are using charter parties that were, you know, written 70 years ago quite comfortably. The idea that somehow we take these charter parties and other types of contracts and codify them into some IT code. 
that then the actual commercial people, practitioners don't really understand what that code is. How do they amend the code? Because they are a liberty to make changes, make amendments and add rider clauses uh, to any contract. And again, it's just it's taking away this sort of feeling of, of control, things that they're comfortable with at the moment, the way they could control the commercial environment. And therefore, after experiences, was, was they weren't that sort of warm to the idea at all. Um, certainly at th this moment in time, we can see the way that um, processes may be sped up through digitalization, removing the paper process. But when it comes to actually self-executing contract or even part of a contract that might self-execute, there we find people are a little bit uncomfortable at the moment. Thank you, Grant. Um, so basically, Andrew laid the foundations, Julian raised our expectations, uh, some dose of reality uh, or warning from Grant. Uh, that now let's get the real dose of reality from the Law Commission. Uh, Grant, sorry, you, you wanted to... Uh, I just wanted to say last thing, I, don't, I wanted to like cast a sort of negative thing, I'll be very cynical about this, but I can share with you an experience of a smart contract I had today. I went to park my car and I used an app that it basically links you to a private parking space here in London. Uh, and I booked up the space, all very done. I obviously it's a, an underlying contract that commits you to using this parking space. Automatic payment was made. I went to drive to the car parking space and the gas board had closed off the road. So I couldn't get there, but the app didn't know that. So uh, there you go. There's an, ex an instant experience with the smart contract where things aren't quite as polished as they could be. So now I'm looking to work out how you get a refund. Well, on that basis, we should turn to Law Commission. Um... Uh, Daniela, um, I know, I mean, we said at the beginning and everybody I think uh, knows that Law Commission is looking at it. Could you please tell us uh, more about the work of the Law Commission, which is ongoing on this subject? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. So the Law Commission is currently looking into the law as it applies to smart contracts. And um, just to give a little bit of background to, to the project in general. So the UK Jurisdiction Task Force in November two years ago published a legal statement on crypto assets and smart contracts. And it was off the back of that legal statement that the commission was asked to look into a little bit more detail around how existing law can accommodate smart contracts. So it's probably worth saying at that point that we are looking at it very generically. So it's not specifically focused on any particular use cases, but having said that, it's very interesting to hear some views on how we think smart contracts can apply in the context of shipping specifically. So yes, the, the Law Commission is currently investigating, investigating that. Where we are in the project lifecycle is we issued a call for evidence in December last year. And effectively what that does is it sets out our current understanding and view of what smart contracts are, their main characteristics and features and how we think existing law can accommodate them. And the call for evidence asks a series of questions and basically invites the public and consultees and stakeholders to give us their view on whether they think that we have got it right or got it wrong, to put it quite bluntly. And that call for evidence closed at the end of March. So where we are now is we're busy analyzing various responses, investigating issues, seeing some potential areas that we maybe need to revisit. And the ultimate deliverable is a scoping study, which will be published towards the end of the year. And the scoping study will set out how existing law applies to smart contracts and potential areas of future work or reform. And it's probably also, also worth saying that the Law Commission is looking at two other projects. The one is digitization of international trade documents, such as bills of lading, which I know we have discussed and touched on today. And at the same time, the Law Commission is also looking at a broader project around crypto assets and how those should be classified from an English law perspective. And both of the consultation project consultation papers for those two projects, uh, we are aiming to issue those by the end of the month. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela, for this brilliant uh, introduction to the work of the Law Commission. Um, I'll, I'll come back to Daniela and the Law Commission in a minute, but I think um, we could move to a different stage and uh, maybe turn back to Andrew Tettenborn, linking to uh, Law Commission's work. Um, Andrew, I know uh, you quite well, and I know that you are uh, probably, uh, you can be probably described as a traditional 
uh, common law, yeah. Um, what do you expect uh, in terms of common law being able to deal with this new concept? Uh, are you expecting it to be able to deal with uh, the challenges which might uh, come, like the grants issue? Um, or uh, is a completely different new approach necessary? So are you urging the Law Commission to consider rewriting the code, so to speak? <clears throat> well, as a conservative, I'm very unhappy about calling for a completely new approach to anything. Uh, because I think it's likely to cause more problems than advantages. Now, my general feeling, actually, is that the common law overall is pretty capable of dealing with contracts that are self-performing. Uh, what you are going to face is one or two specific difficulties, which it might actually be an idea to legislate about, uh, if only because business people, and of course we want to encourage business people to use English law, uh, business people aren't too keen on large amounts of their money being spent on providing decisions of the Court of Appeal of interest to law students. Um, and there are a number of things which may need to be sorted out. One is a simple one. Um, You've got issues like, for example, payment by mistake. Can a machine make a mistake? Uh, it's a very nice question. It used to arise, of course, in criminal law. Can you deceive a machine? Um, I can't remember what the answer was. It got rather complex at the end. Uh, but it might be interesting just to think about that. And if necessary, say, you know, for the purposes of recovery of money paid by a mistake, um, a mistake will be deemed to have been made in the following circumstances. So you know, if you can lay it down by legislation, you do a lawyer out of a job, which I'm afraid is always quite a good thing when it comes to business people. Uh, but anyway, that, that's one fairly typical example. Another one actually was picked up by Sarah. It's rather a pity that Sarah isn't here. Um, how far can a smart contract be affected by error? And of course, I suppose this is, this is really an application of what Grant was talking about a couple of minutes ago. Um, you know, what counts as an error which might be regarded as um, affecting the obligation under a smart contract? How do you deal with rectification? of a smart contract. Now that's something which is getting all sorts of obligations lawyers very excited at the moment um, because the Court of Appeal has just said effectively it believes the House of Laws didn't know what it was talking about uh, when it talked about the requirements for rectification. <laughs> If you want details, I'll give you those later. But anyway, uh, that again is something which you might care to think about um, in dealing with uh, smart contracts. And I'll just, I'll just uh, bowl you another googly, if I'm allowed to use old fashioned cricket terms, unlike the England Cricket Board, which wants to modernize everything. Um, there are quite detailed rules in the Insurance Act about what counts as knowledge by an insurance company of particular facts um, and how far that affects the duty of fair presentation and what amounts for that matter to knowledge by the assured. Um, Googly for you, what is the status of knowledge by an algorithm? Do you treat the algorithm as if it was the janitor whose knowledge doesn't count, or as if it was the CEO whose knowledge does? I'm not quite sure what the answer is. Um, I'm tempted to say it's up to you clever people at the Law Commission to work one out. But it is, it seems to me, the sort of thing that would be worth thinking about. The, 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 anyway, the, those are just a number of examples of, of, of things where I think uh, a closer look might be a good idea. 
Thank you, Andrew. As provocative as, as ever. Um, I, I think, Julian, I mean, uh, maybe I can throw a good really as well to you uh, in terms of um, your enthusiasm with regard to smart contracts. Um, I know that your firm and yourself work a lot in, in cyber uh, risks, um, you know, uh, particularly for the shipping sector. Do you think that the cyber risks um, could potentially delay the development and use of smart contracts, uh, particularly in shipping contexts? Um, I'm going to give an unusual answer for me, I think. Uh, I, you know, Barish, I, cyber risk in shipping is the thing that keeps me awake at night. Uh, and and we've, we've spoken about that a lot. But actually, in, in answer to that question, my answer is no. Uh, it's the one area where I don't think cyber at risk will slow down the adoption of smart contracts. I think what will slow down the adoption of smart contracts is more the issues that Grant and Andrew have outlined. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because if the drivers to adopt smart contracts in relation to potentially reducing dispute because of autom automation, um, and I accept what Grant says about that, about that. That's a very difficult thing to get commercial parties to accept. But if you could get to that, and that does result in uh, commerciality, so savings in time and cost, and, and um, uh, sadly for me uh, and the other lawyers on the call, it, it reduces the need and use for lawyers. I can see that that will be the driver, and that 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 momentum will outpace the risk of cyber. Um, now. I'm not, when I'm saying that, don't 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 for a minute um, think that I'm saying I don't think there is a cyber risk in relation to smart contracts. I think I think there is. There's a, there's a significant risk. Um, we we've seen examples of uh, hackers looking at uh, affecting and uh, trying to hack into code. Uh, and of course, one of the issues here is if I if I have a written contract and somebody in the office decides to change the provisions of that written contract, that's pretty obvious to everybody that sees the contract. But if I could, if I could hack into a system and change a line of code, how do you identify that? Um, and especially now that you have um, hackers that can deploy malware, that can uh, do its job, go in and change a code, change a function, but then effectively delete itself from the system, that does create huge, huge problems. So I, I think, I, I don't think that cyber risk itself will slow down the adoption, but I think it's something that the industry will have to move to address um, because of the, the risk is certainly going to be there. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That's that's actually quite an interesting observation. Uh, Grant, um, coming back to you, um, I know the points you raise, uh, and uh, to a certain extent, I do agree with you. But how soon do you think we should expect the smart contracts uh, to become uh, common in shipping practice? I know you probably answered this implicitly in your previous uh, uh, answer, but uh, can I put you on the spot a bit more on this? Uh, yeah, you probably get the impression I'm saying not anytime soon. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm going to come right back to what Andrew said right at the very beginning. In order for anything like this to succeed, I think we need as, in an industry a rigid adherence to documentary standards. They all need to be put in place first. There's lots and lots of work that needs to be done in order for this all to work. Uh, and in my mind, one of the issues that always troubles me is that, you know, if we're going to be thinking about smart contracts for charter parties, what is it people are actually signing up to? We say, okay, these are the terms and conditions of the charter parties and the owners and the charter are going to sign up to that, but somehow that's going to be codified by IT people. Um, and, and then who understands what is actually going to the code? Who's going to check it and compare it with the original charter party? We have a lot of archaic terms and charter parties that lawyers are very comfortable with and they make a livelihood out of arguing over what they actually mean. And that doesn't directly translate in how you sort of codify a sort of a, a simple contract. So I can see there are lots of obstacles in the way is, is to sort of making this function in a way that would be useful and, and be seen as a real benefit to the industry. So um, I think that there are lots of steps to overcome uh, in, the, in the future before we could even get to the stage where people would 
see smart contracts as uh, adding particular value. But when it comes to those charter parties and things, I, I think in you know, the, the uh, supply chain logis logistics uh, industry, I think they're fine with it. I think they make really good use of this technology. I think it's a whole different ballgame when it comes to mainstream charter parties and, and, and purchase related agreements like buying fuel. I think there's probably still a lot of work to be done to, to make people uh, comfortable with it. And, and, and to give one example, I, I think of um, BIMCO charter parties are all produced in the English language. Uh, years gone by, we used to do Spanish versions, French versions, but we realized we've got to do an English. We're a standards organization. The language of shipping is English, so they're all written in English. Uh, there are certain countries in the world, obviously, that perhaps they, they feel their English is not that strong. Um, France is a particular one where we see an example of and what they do. They make an unofficial translation of the BIMCO contract, and so the parties can read it in French, but they sign the English language one because that's what binds them. And, and that's what I'm thinking along the lines of in the future, what, what are the parties going to be bound to? You know, you've got this electronic contract in code with algorithms, whatever, that only real specialists are going to understand, be able to interpret. And then you've got to have the written version that people perhaps bind themselves by. But how do we know they're exactly the same? And who determines if there's a dispute between the two or an irregularity in some way? So um, I just think there's lots and lots of obstacles to overcome. Maybe the technology is there, but I think there's a lot of work to be done in the industry. So I imagine years away from this. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Grant. Um, um, before we actually uh, take uh, questions from the audience, and there are already some very, very interesting questions, I, I would like to turn to the Law Commission, really, Daniela. Um, I mean, I, I completely understand uh, your point that you are looking at it from a generic perspective. But today you had an opportunity to hear some of the issues, concerns, hopes of the shipping sector. Have you heard anything today uh, concerning the shipping law and potential users of smart contracts in shipping context, which you hadn't heard before uh, when you started the project? Um, so, um, a general question, really. Uh, have you been surprised with anything, basically, you heard today? So, so thanks for your question, and I, I think I will answer, but I'd like to just say a few things in response to what's been discussed by Andrew, Julian, and, and Grant before I do so, so if that's okay. Um, so I think what's quite important when we talk about smart contracts, what we need to think about is, and I think this is something Grant also trust, uh, touched on, is differentiating smart contracts from other technology that can enable its use. So when Andrew was talking about digitization of documents and how that may affect the uptake of smart contracts because you may need to have certain standard terms incorporated or digitized documents so that the contract, you, everyone's, you know, the, the computer program is, is reading the same, the same language. That is, that is all true, but I think, you know, those are other technologies and progresses that need to be made to be able to support smart contracts as opposed to really looking at the smart contract technology itself and what that does. And that brings me to another point that we need to think about. Smart contracts can take a variety of different forms. You can have, you know, natural language agreement with automated performance. You can have hybrid agreements. And so in specifically, maybe the shipping context and other areas, it's important to note that there is a bit of flexibility around how you structure these agreements and how you use them to carry out whatever purposes it is that you want to be carried out. I think what um, some of the issues that Andrew was drawing out around charter and things like that are not particularly novel to the shipping industry. I think the point that they draw out is that there may be obligations where you need elements of discretion, where you need to retain elements of control. And the Law Commission is very aware of this. And it's something that we do point out that smart contracts aren't suitable for all types of obligations. So it's very important that you understand what they should be used for. And it's very, you know, conditional obligations where the logic is quite simple and potentially even quite rudimentary in the beginning. So you, it's not the position that you should necessarily use smart contracts for all kinds of obligations. So if it's not fit for purpose, you know, there's no reason to displace the conventional contract. So I think as back to your question, in the, did I hear anything today specifically in the shipping industry? I don't think so. The, the same issues arise across the board when it, when it comes to the use of smart contracts. And there's a lot to think about. So some of the issues around mistake and rectification and errors in code, these, these come up and these are issues that the Law Commission is, 
is currently looking at and seeing how do we apply existing legal principles to these very difficult questions. And it's also worth saying that unlike quite a few of, unlike most of the Law Commission projects, we're not proposing any reform. So that might um, make Andrew feel a bit more comfortable. This is very much a scoping study just to sort of see how we think existing or can accommodate smart contracts, but there's no actual proposals for reform yet in this in the scoping study itself. Thank you, Daniela. That's that's very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, wh when I decided to uh, chair this event, I thought it would be very easy, really, because, you know, all I have to do is to direct questions to people and the uh, panel will do the job. But now looking at the questions, I'm realizing that it's actually probably a bit more difficult than I initially thought it would be because there are very, very interesting questions coming. And of course, we got about 13 minutes. Uh, we have to try to answer as many as possible. Um, so I am going to choose some of these questions because I think they are very, very good questions uh, and certainly will enhance the debate. Um, the first question is to Andrew. Uh, Philip put a number of questions, but this one is actually quite a good starting point. Um, he says, with increasing qu uh, quality, quantity of uh, IE, we will probably have to establish a legal concept of uh, AE, sorry, artificial intelligence entity, which is distinguishable from legal uh, and private person. This could address some of the conceptual issues behind self-learning and self-determining codes. Uh, what, what is your views of uh, the prospect of establishing a new personality for artificial intelligence, Andrew? Well, that actually is a very good question, Philip. Um, I thought about this, and frankly, I don't think I, I think that's a, a rabbit hole we shouldn't go down. Uh, let me ex let, uh, let me explain why. Um, I don't think that there's any real advantage in regarding AI as in any way entitled to separate legal personality. What there is, is a need to consider how, and it comes back to what I said earlier, how far an artificially intelligent machine can be mistaken how far an artificially intelligent machine can be negligent, uh, because actually that's a very that's a very difficult problem, because as it is, if a human being does something stupid, you can sue the bastard. Uh, if a machine does something stupid, then provided that the human being who programmed it didn't do anything stupid, you can't sue the bastard. And that actually is one of the problems that we're going to have to think about. So um, I know the European Parliament had the bright idea of saying that I, uh, AI ought to have some kind of legal personality. Um, I'm happy to be convinced, but I haven't been convinced yet, and I think I will take some convincing. That probably won't satisfy you, but you, I'm very happy to try again if you, if you have a further question. Thank you, Andrew. If you know Andrew as much as I do, that's probably the dumbest statement he can give, uh, you know, uh, dumb in the sense that, you know, it's a no-go area. That's what he's saying, basically, in a very polite way. Um, Julian, if, if you don't mind, I would like to... Uh, sorry, actually, Grant probably would be better to take this one. Uh, Elias asks a question. What would the parties need to trust highly specialized coders to form the smart contract? Shall the industry trust uh, from lawyers to coders, or shall they rely on both? A legal contract for purposes for legal purposes, and the smart contract just effectuating performance? Question mark. It's a very interesting question. Uh, what I'd like you to do is trust BIMCO because I think this all uh, circles around the fact we need standards in the industry. In the same way that for over a hundred years BIMCO is producing 
standard contracts and standard clauses in writing on bits of paper, I see no reason if the demand arrived in a few years for smart contracts to be developed or parts of smart contracts, particular provisions within the contract, that we wouldn't also develop those as building blocks for a, a contract. But I think you need to have some sort of standardization of this. I think it would be a backward step if we went from having well-used written standard contracts of the industry to somehow individual IT people developing contracts together with specialized lawyers or whatever. We're just creating more work. That, that isn't the point of all this. We're meant to be sort of speeding up and making things more efficient. So I think you need to look to organizations to develop contracts at the moment and see how they could work to develop standards uh, for a digitized world where we could look at smart contracts there as well. So I think we would be looking in the future perhaps ourselves think about build, creating these building blocks because I, again how do you deal with the issue of that you know if you want to you know make an amendment to one of these these uh, written pieces of code for part of a contract or a charter party i think it all starts to get very complex and if you're starting from scratch and all other companies are also developing their own smart contracts i don't think we've helped the industry at all so i think it all comes back to, again standardizing standardizing this process as much as possible and not leaving it some sort of freelance uh, thing being done by all sorts of different people around the world. Thank you, Grant, that's, that's very interesting. Um, uh, Julian, uh, I was threatening earlier, but I think this one is definitely right up your alley. Um, Ali has a question. Um, what are your opinions about the role of smart ports on smart contracts? When the cargo is delivered to the buyer at a smart port, is it possible for the freight to be directly transferred to the charter's owner's account with a smart contract? If that's possible, could smart ports be the center or control mechanism of smart contracts for maritime trade? That, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, let me think about that. I'm still struggling, thanks to Andrew, with the concept of the reasonable AI on the automated Clapham omnibus. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I, I, th I think I think you're exactly right to link smart smart port, ports with smart contracts because um, you know what we're talking about the the benefit if we do get there uh, and when, when we get there you know in years or if we, if we get there in a shorter time the the driver for it will be uh, efficiency um, and so a smart contract in isolation on its own okay but a smart contract that's linking into a logistical system that's actually linking into a smart port yeah I, I think I think that is going to be something but I think Daniela actually hit the nail on the head when she was speaking about this and effectively it's a horses for courses approach you know we're not I don't think any of us are saying and I also totally agree with Grant what he said about standardization is is the only way forward for proper application of smart contracts in the maritime sector is that we're not saying that there'll be a smart contract for every single part of the logistical chain. Uh, we'll, we'll apply smart contracts uh, at, point, at, at positions where they can simplify, speed up, take away the level of disputes in the process. And for me, what I think we'll see is a hybrid uh, between the utilization of smart contracts and written contracts. We're certainly not seeing the extinction, extinction of written contracts. So my, my answer is yes. I think uh, uh, the, to link smart ports to smart contracts is is, is a very clever idea. Uh, Julian, uh, since you are still here uh, um, and I haven't passed on to anybody, Simon, my colleague from the Institute uh, of Shipping and Trade Law has a question which probably uh, should come to you as well. Uh, which with, with will digitalization of relevant data, which Julian alluded to, together with the marriage calculation software, which already exists, bring an end to disputes about submission of documents and claims within 90 day frame commonly specified in void charges, or will it lead to a reduction in the submission uh, time specified in those charges? Uh, Grant, I mean, uh, after Julian, I'm very happy if you want to take this one as well. I, I think there is scope for this. I think there, there is scope for using um, technology to eradicate some of the more um, regular small claims that, you know, no longer cost effective to take them through a legal dispute process. If we could speed some of those up, uh, I think there is, there is a way to do it. I think there is a benefit of doing that. So, um, yeah, I think there is an application. But again, I'm interested to see what grants for you is. 
Yeah, thanks, Julian. I'll probably take a slightly different angle on this. No, I think we've got to see um, what we're talking about today in the much larger context that what the industry is driving towards is much greater efficiency, shipping efficiency, port efficiency. And it would be nice to think that in the future, claims re relating to demurrage will perhaps diminish purely because we have a more efficient shipping industry and therefore the lay time allocated is exactly what's used and then the ship sails uh, and we don't have these demurrage issues. So I think things are evolving and lots of things may hopefully change in the future. Uh, I accept the fact that the, the technology can be used to take away the more sort of labor intensive and simpler administrative processes and hopefully um, you know, deal with more minor disputes. But I, I'd, I'd like to think that the general push and drive of the industry that we're seeing at the moment towards greater digitalization would actually reduce that type of dispute over demurrage in the first place anyway, we'd see less and less of it in the future. Thank you. Um, uh, Daniela, uh, there is a question, maybe uh, I, I don't expect you to sort of uh, have a firm view on it, but uh, a question again from Philip, uh, essentially saying, Will the use of smart contracts in the future render the courts redundant, particularly lower courts uh, in terms of the disputes they involve? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, my short answer would be, I don't, no, I don't think so. I think that decisions made by courts are prime examples of obligations or outcomes that we should not really be automating. They involve discretion and a variety of different inputs and considerations that a machine would just not be capable of making. So, no, I don't, I don't see that happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there was a question, actually, maybe uh, I, I go back to uh, Andrew on this one uh, from Darius. Um, he he says, well, he wants to direct to all panelists, but uh, I direct to Andrew. But if anybody else wants to uh, chip in, by all means. Um, what do you think about the recent post office managers uh, issue? Could that offer a warning of what can go with machines? Uh, he says the managers have been accused of theft or fraud, if I remember correctly, whereas it was the machine program which had been wrong. Well, I think it's I, I, I think uh, you certainly have to be very careful over that. Um, and it comes back to the fact that there are certain things that machines can't do. And we have to be quite careful to keep them out, keep them out of those areas. Um, the classic example, actually, was, was one that came up from a point made by Julian earlier on off hire clauses. Because um, Julian says, oh, well, we can just make it much simpler. Um, you know, you have the Internet of Things to see when, when something went wrong and when it was put right. Now, that's, of course, OK for some off hire clauses, but not for others. Uh, if the off-hire clause simply takes the ship off-hire until a particular defect is repaired, which is the standard with, for example, BP time or the oil time charter parties, that's easy. If it's an off-hire clause that calls for quite detailed questions of causation as to how much loss of use was caused by the difficulty, then actually I think it's going to be very much more difficult to get the machine to work that out. And how so about if it is a catch-all provision uh, in the off fire clause? Any <laughs> other clause uh, affecting the full working of the vessel, for example? Oh, it is, but I mean, so, so, some, clause, some clauses do depend on questions of causation and some don't. And causation actually is bloody difficult even for the sort of up-to-date AI software that we've got these days. Uh, it may learn AI software can now write music in the style of Mozart. So in the end, presumably, it might be able to deal with legal questions of causation. Uh, but I doubt if it's there yet. Um, so I, I, I think, yes, Darius is right. You've got to be very careful about the decisions that you entrust to machines. Thank you. Um, I'm cautious of the time, but uh, would like to offer to all the panel members uh, a chance if they want to add anything, uh, starting 
uh, from Grant, because uh, he's on the left part of my screen. Uh, Grant, any, any further observations after what you heard, what you heard? Yeah, and no, actually just to pick up on what Andrew was talking about there, I mean, it's, it's fair enough, you know, that technology and computers can help in the decision making process, but there are certain decisions I think for a long time need to rest with human beings. And I, I think a good example is perhaps um, with, with war risks and piracy clauses that we have in charter parties that were dependent upon a master's subjective assessment of if there is a danger to his vessel and crew that may not be the same for you know another type of ship just a, you know half a mile away so these are very difficult things for a machine to assess no matter how many sensors there are it's this sort of subjective assessment of, of risk that i think we're still quite some way away from um and, and i think we still need that sort of human element because it's, it's, it plays out in the contract itself but it's not something that lends itself to just a simple application of technology i think it's something that assists in the decision um, but it can't be the final uh, deciding factor. Thank you, uh, Grant. Uh, Julian, anything you would like to add? Uh, just to say thank you to everybody. And it, again, as always with these things, it, it, it raises fascinating uh, uh, discussions and concepts. Uh, I, I think that where we'll see the, the pressures on the shipping industry is the utilisation of smart contracts in um, logis the logistics and trade operations further down the line that will start to move closer towards impacting on shipping. So then shipping looking to adopt those techniques. Um, so I think it's something that we will see coming, uh, but I, I, do I do tend to agree with Grant. You know, it's, it's not something that's good to be immediate. And certainly we're not getting to the position that we're uh, eradicating the importance and the role of the human being in all of this, thank goodness. And I think that's a relief to Grant as well, given that he is the head of closes uh, at PIMCO. Well, you're still in job, Grant, for a few more years, I think. Um, and then the last but not least, of course, Daniela, uh, is there anything you would like to add? Thanks. Um, I'd probably like to just add that where I think smart contracts may be most utilized is, a, is in a hybrid context so where you have a mixture of natural language and code and it depends on the certain obligations and therefore people can get the best of both worlds in that sense rather than having to pick one one or other forms i think that would be an interesting space to watch um, and just to, just to mention if anyone is interested i mean that the singapore i think it was court of appeal did um, decide a case on this last year, which dealt specifically with looking at issues of mistake and unilateral mistake and, and common mistake in the context of um, algorithm trading on a cryptocurrency exchange. So if anyone is interested, there is um, quite a leading case on that, which is just an interesting read. So, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That, that, that was definitely an interesting. It was Singapore uh, case, uh, that one, wasn't yes. it? Uh, and I, yes. I think they were buying, uh, I think the machine made a mistake, so they sold very cheap, uh, cheaply the uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the algorithms were programmed in such a way to, to the offers and buys, and they were triggered, and they tried to reverse the transaction. So based, the argument raised was really around mistake and how that applied in that specific context, in the context of automated performance. So it's quite on point for some of the points we've raised today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, we're just a few minutes over the time, but uh, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to thank all the panelists, uh, because I think um, even though we didn't have a rigid format, I think it was very informative, and I certainly uh, learned a lot, and I believe all the participants uh, learned a lot. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this was our fourth event. There's a fifth one coming in May uh, on uh, multimodal transport, air transport, uh, all sorts of stuff, more bed and butter of shipping. Uh, so we would like to see you there uh, in May. But otherwise, uh, thank you very much for being part of this uh, venture with us. And I hope to see some of you in real uh, uh, context soon. So thank you very much. Uh, good day. Uh, and if you are joining us from east, from the east, good evening. Mm.